my biggest fear was getting hurt or getting injured or not performing and meeting a standard for something. It was never like, oh, what if I quit? It's Brandon Dawson here. Welcome to another episode of Building Billions. I have some great guys here. This is an episode you're not going to want to miss. You know, it takes a lot to choose to build a business, let alone be an eight figure, nine figure or 10 figure earner. But some things are tougher than building businesses. And one thing I know in my experience in life is people who are tough. I'm gonna introduce you to a couple guys here. Actually, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, tell you who they are, what they do for a living, and we're gonna jump into this episode of Building Billions. Guys, introduce yourself. Hey, Brandon, thanks. So I'm Sean Matson, co-founder and CEO of a company called Mapbox. We sell gear and technology that we've developed over the years back to the government. And prior to starting the business, served 13 years as a Navy SEAL. A Navy SEAL, here you go. <laughs> and his buddy, Zach. Good to be here, Zach Steinbach. So Sean and I actually went through training together and then went to SEAL Team 4 together and Iraq together and everything else. And now we're running that block together. So how long have you guys been business partner? So officially it's 13 years, but we had the initial concept and idea back from 2006. So 2006 timeframe, so it's been 16 years. 16 years now. So were you operating in 2006 or were you conceptualizing? We were conceptualizing what Mapbox is now in 2006 with this idea of this new cargo net system for the military. We were actually flying from San Diego up to Alaska and sitting on the back of a C-130 screaming at each other about how we could make this system better and landed in Alaska. Scr started... Screaming at each other yeah, because the, you can't hear the you. roar of the engines. You got yeah. headsets on. So one of my business partners was probably one of the guys flying. So he was stationed in Kuwait, did Syria. So he had multiple missions, yeah. but uh, we he was flying. We didn't even get a headset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we had earplugs in. And... Oh, you didn't get a headset. No, no, no. we had softies. We were literally, like I said, sitting in front of the laptop, with these pallet systems right in front of us. And we just sat here and we have roughly 30 to 40 guys that we went through training with. And we failed to make this, build this pallet over and over again. All you're doing is putting gear on a pallet, putting a cargo net system together, nets together. And we're like, there's gotta be a better way. So we sat there for that eight hour flight up to Alaska and redesigned the whole thing on the back of it. And then, then we started training and deploying and it took us years to finally get it to where we made the business start. Inception of the, the business was 2010. And then even at that point, we were still active and serving and deploying, but we knew we needed to protect ourselves as we were gonna to try to build this kind of side hustle. And then it wasn't until 2018, 17, 18, before we left the service and have devoted 100% of our time 100% of your attention. And you guys have built the business now based on, and, and I think what's amazing is that you guys sat around your buddies you're serving together, you're in an intense environment. Were you guys deployed together? We did first deployment. Yeah, the first deployment was, we were actually co-located for most of it. And actually before that, I turned over with you on that first oh, one. Oh yeah, yeah. So he was out a few months before I was, and then I came in and backfilled him for a few months. And, and then a few months later, we both went to the same location and we were co-located in Baghdad with each other. What was that like? You guys were buddies before. Did you guys meet in? How did you guys become friends? So we were actually swim buddies in BUDS. We met at BUDS, the training for become a SEAL and yeah. became swim buddies and just started. So you met in training? Yeah. We did. Yeah. So he went to the Naval Academy. I went to VMI. So obviously two different schools. He wrestled. I was a swimmer. So we didn't know each other at all until we got out to BUDS. And I don't even really remember when like the first, like other than obviously being a swim buddy, but I think our class started with 140 guys and we graduated 19 of those 140 guys. And two of us, uh, these are two of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> the two crazy guys. Yeah. yeah. So I did a tour there in San Diego, I don't know, six months ago to the whole campus, all the new stuff that they're building. And they were talking about how many guys come in, the resilience and toughness of who makes it through and that at the beginning, when you're looking at 120 guys, if you try to go through and do a lottery of who would or wouldn't make it through, you'd be wrong most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you think that some guys show up and they're huge and they're strong, but they end up being mental giants. Like they just check out and can't make it through. And then you have the, sometimes little guys show up and you're like, oh man, they're not gonna be able to get through this and like you blow through it. So from your experience, what was that whole experience? Because to come out on the elite side of such a huge sample, because anybody that can qualify to even show up has to be special in some regards, would you agree? 
Yeah, I know for me personally, I never had, oh, I'm gonna quit or like fear of quitting. Like I went into it knowing that my biggest fear was getting hurt or getting injured or not performing and meeting a standard for something. It was never like, oh, what if I quit? Like I never had that even in my thought whatsoever. There were times obviously during it, and I think most guys that go through it, they always say like they have their like defining moment. And it's like where you're really pushed mentally and it's just, okay, like I know I can do this. I just don't know how to do it. And then all of a sudden it's like this inner voice that hits you in the head and you're just like, oh yeah, that, that's so simple. Why wasn't I doing that? And then you just, you cruise the rest of the way through hell week or whatever that like inner voice moment was for you. And how about you? ADD. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, people always ask, oh, what's the secret to buds? What's the secret to buds? And I swear to you, it's ADD. And I, the reason is because you can't focus on the pain long enough to quit. It, it's, your mind is always just on the next thing. Like, so. This sucks. Oh man, that's a lie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> look at the shiny sand. So, you know, it, it sounds ridiculous, but at the same time, it's, if you're always thinking about what's next or how your buddy's doing or you know, what the next evolution is, or, you know, how, where's the turnaround point on the run? Instead of thinking about yourself in the moment, you never stay there present long enough to think about how bad your knees hurt and how bad your shoulders hurt. And for me, it was my back, because I was constantly carrying <laughs> Carrying Sean. him? Yeah. No, I heard that, he yeah. said that before the show. He was like, man, this guy carried me around everywhere. <laughs> that's our running, like whenever we have conference calls or something, that's the running thing is who can get that in first and not make it like the first thing you say is, oh, I carry him. No, it's- You gotta it's work always, it into the conversation. You gotta work it into a conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would do this all the time. We always have like fun games like that, where we're just like, oh, like play like a game. And it's like, you meet new people. And like when we were traveling, like we'd meet like groups of people and things like that. And they like, you never tell them what we would do. And so like we would just, one person would say what it is and you just have to pick up and play along. So you with, made a game with it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we made a game with it. So when you think about what it takes to be in that line of work, right? And that committed and dedicated, cause you're not just committed and dedicated to yourself. You're on a team. And what you were saying, you, you are thinking about how do I help my team and how do I stay in the game for them? What are some examples? Cause when I think of business owners, they don't look at their team members, their employees that way. They look at them like them in a lot of cases, oh, me, and then I have my employees, right? And then they get frustrated that they don't have a team. And I always tell business owners, well, if you don't treat your employees like their core component to your team, like you're in the battle of winning in business together. They just don't think that way. And so they get frustrated, them, they talk about their employees. I can't find good people, or it's hard to find anybody who cares like I do. What did you learn in your military training and being deployed together and being in the field together and being in situations where you had to have each other's back. How have you been able to translate that to business? Yeah, so we would always say well, mission teammates self. And that would apply to everything, especially when you get back for an op. You always take care of mission essential gear and then help out your teammates and then take care of yourself last. And so the way Sean and I view it is, is the same way in business. And we always try to take care of our people and, and help them especially when it comes to accomplishing the goals of the mission of, of the company. And so we know that if we take care of our people, they're gonna do the same thing and help us take care of the company and our goals and everything else. And we also know that a distracted employee is not gonna produce the same way as one that knows that we're gonna help them through whatever personal issue or goal they might have going on in their lives. If we help them take care of that, then they're gonna put more into the company. So. It absolutely translates. We try really hard to run it very similar to how we ran our platoons, right? And it, it's a lot of big boy roles. It's a lot of like, I should not have to sit here and tell you to do certain things, right? I'm expecting you already to do it because that's why you're hired to do this job. It's like a, a breacher. I don't need to go back and check to make sure every one of his caps are in, in his breach. If it doesn't go off when we're on the mission, you have an AAR or after action report and, and everyone makes fun of him and then he puts in a case of beer and then he's probably gonna get beat for something. There's always consequences afterwards if something doesn't happen, but they're constantly wanting to help everybody else grow and everybody else move and know that what they're doing has an impact downrange. So even like our sewers, we have one of our litters that help rescue a guy in Afghanistan in our warehouse where they sew and it's like, it's where they meet around every morning before they start their day to sew. They're staring right at this ripped litter and they know that saved somebody. Like we get stuff sent to us pretty regularly on stuff with that bag was in this mission or hey, this was doing on this or this was just on this. Actually, just recently, one of our autofocus night vision goggle accessories 
or what we call the Tartar's Ear, was just on when Biden was over overseas. Like guys were wearing it and people were sending it to us and hey, that's you guys' stuff. It's, yeah, that it is. It's, all these guys are using that stuff.